Well, hey there, everybody. Matt Heller here, founder of Performance Optimist Consulting and the author of The Myth of Employee Burnout, here with another exciting episode of Three Questions. This is where I get to ask three questions of a guest, they get to ask three questions of me, and we just see where the conversation goes. We have no idea what those questions are going to be when we start, so all of our answers are unrehearsed and unprepared. Today, I am super excited to welcome Heather Barnes as my guest. Heather is the Director of Guest Experiences at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Heather and I have worked together on IAPA committees. Uh, I've had the pleasure of going up to MSI to work a little bit. Um, so it's really been great to be uh, Heather's friend and colleague over the last uh, several years. So I'm excited to have Heather on the call today. So Heather, why don't you just say hello and tell us a little bit about what you do. Hi there, and thank you for having me. This is really exciting. I am, as you mentioned, Heather Barnes, and I work at the Museum of Science and Industry as the Director of Guest Experiences. And I've been here about 10 years, and we've really transformed the way we engage guests in science content. That's my primary function. But within my role, there's the volunteer office and the guest experience teams, all of the facilitators that engage guests in science content and deliver the programs, and also our specialized experience team, uh, those that revenue generate for our museum by offering cool programs like snoozeums, which up to 1,200 guests can come and spend the night at the museum. And that's really fun. And so we're a big team. We're really guest focused. We're really uh, our, our main experience is to exceed overall guest experiences while reaching our mission and vision, which is to inspire the inventive genius in everyone. We want kids to go and achieve their full potential in science, technology, engineering, and medicine. So we are really passionate about our mission and vision and about how we get there being really guest focused. Awesome. Awesome. And what do you call this? Snoozeum? Yeah, the Snoozeum <laughs> is where... Wait, does that count as one of your questions? No, it doesn't. <laughs> This museum is a night at the museum where families or Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts can come and spend a night at the museum and have access to everything and see and do programs and go through the coal mine and it's really fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that, that term, museum. That's very cool. Um, so now, speaking of questions, are you ready for your first one? Yes. All I'm right. nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Um, so the first question actually has to do with something that you and I are currently working on with IAPA, and that's the Women yeah. in Leadership webinar. Yes. So you've done some great research, but I would love to hear kind of your perspective um, of being a woman in a leadership role. What kind of things have you had to overcome? You know, because I know you've worked in corporate positions before, working at the museum, and um, you know, mm -hmm. any advice or insight that you can provide to people who are who are maybe struggling with some of those issues. You know, there's a thank, thank you. There's a ton of issues out there um, for women in leadership positions, and I think it's highly personal what people experience and how they experience it. Um, for me, as a woman in a leadership position, I've always put my head down and done the very best job that I could in any role that I'm in, and navigated the environment that I've in that whatever environment I'm in to do my best and then my work has fortunately I've worked in really great places I've been rewarded and I've been promoted and I've gotten to see um, outcomes of hard work and I also am really lucky and fortunate to work for some phenomenal women I mean my current boss Andrea Ingram which is our vice president of education and guest experiences at the museum uh, has been a, a phenomenal leader and role model and advocate and I think working with strong women, working with strong women leaders has certainly been a benefit to me. And I think a piece of advice would be for those that would like to learn more is seeking out strong women in leadership positions and ask them to be a mentor. There's also another woman at the museum, um, Ann Rashford, the director of temporary exhibits. And I think she has a lot of great skills. And so I ask for her feedback and advice about how she navigates difficult situations and how she works through um, real big challenges within the institution and within other institutions. And so that's been really helpful for me. Uh, but I know that there's a lot out there, and this might be too long of an answer. Um, I'm a single woman, but the question for women that are married with kids, the career life balance comes up quite a bit. So I hope to, on this webinar, tackle some questions on, on people's minds and talk about how people are getting skipped over for promotions and talk about uh, 
how people are perceived as overly assertive by speaking up in meetings because there's a lot of research out there. So I'm hoping to get the crux of some of those issues and hear from other women industry leaders as well. Awesome. So can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, but does that count as the second question? No, it's like question 1A. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. Um, so you mentioned uh, a couple times, you know, looking for strong leaders as role models. So what are some of those criteria that you would look for um, that other people can look for in, in people that might be helpful mentors to them? Sure. People that are that, that have a, a great communication style, that have strong ethics, that have demonstrated strong leadership skills and qualities. Um, people with fantastic rich backgrounds that may be different than your own. I have a really unique background and it's completely different than both my boss and the woman that I informally work with um, is a mentor and then I have another woman leader that is more of a professional coach to me that has a completely different background. So I can learn from different skills. So I'm assessing my own strengths and weaknesses and seeking out people that have either different strengths and weaknesses or that can really help me think about different ways to work through my weaknesses based on their experiences. And it's through building personal connections and seeing what you like in a leader and then following through. So I, I, my, some of my connections have been intentional and some of them have, have been um, just out of luck. You know, my current boss is, is really supportive and I've been lucky and I've learned a lot of how to be fair and how to be equitable and how to be a strong leader and how to stick to my ground. And that's really helped me when we think about employee relations and how to be f fair and follow up with people that aren't performing and um, the impacts. So, so I'm, I'm very fortunate. I feel like I'm, I'm lucky in that sense to have had strong women leaders in my career that have helped shape where I am today. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Great, uh, great criteria and points to kind of look for in someone to be a mentor. So, are you ready to ask me a question now? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, go for yes. It. Um, okay. No, when, no question 1B? No, no. Okay. Um, the field, you do great work, and we've had you come out to the museum, and you've helped shape the way we coach and reward and recognize and motivate our team members. And many of the strategies that you teach, we have uh, implemented and integrated into our culture here at MSI. And employee engagement is an ever-evolving field. How do you stay current? What, how do you keep ahead of the game? And if you look back how employee engagement was 10 years ago from where it is today versus where it'll be in 10 years, how do you push yourself forward? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think if I could tackle that first part about where it was 10 years ago first, um, I, I think it was more of a concept 10 years ago that people talked about and they didn't really get. So they said, yes, we want employee engagement, but we really don't know how to do it. So yeah. we, can, we can put something together that kind of on the surface is, is an employee engagement program. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, that was sort of the, the, the baby steps you know, in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the first, first uh, iteration of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where it's really grown to is where people really understand what it truly means in that it's about you know, engaging someone's head and their heart and their hands to yeah. make sure that they're doing meaningful work for you and that they understand that they're, they're valuable and how valuable they are, they are and, and how their value goes well beyond the paycheck. Because so yes. often people say, well, I'm paying the person, you know, and there's still that attitude out there yeah. that, oh, that, there is. Yeah. Their, that their reward is the, the number on the paycheck when they get that, you know, every week or two weeks or however they get paid. And so a lot of times if there's no feedback, if there's no recognition, if there's no coaching, people really associate that as their value and they don't see how they fit into the big picture. So I think a lot of people are now starting to really get that. They're starting to understand that it's more than just, even just a rewards program. You know, mm -hmm. if a rewards program isn't um, followed through with, if it's not um, uh, administered correctly or fairly, you know, then it's going to have the opposite effect that you want. You know, absolutely, I'm, I'm all for rewarding people for what they do well, but not at the expense of being fair to everyone or to, um, you know, do it in a meaningful way because there's some people that would, would appreciate 
a simple thank you and a handshake and that's all they need to get keep them going for years and years. Um, there's other people that need a little bit more coaching and a little bit more encouragement and uh, maybe even a little bit more keeping people on the path. Um, and I think, you know, kind of going back to what, um, what engagement really is now, I don't think we can forget that there's discipline in there too, right? Mm -hmm. So right. when yeah. you, when you, encourage someone to coach someone it's not just about hey you did all this great but what'd you screw up what'd you do wrong like you talked a lot about in the first question about understanding your weaknesses and mm -hmm. being able to explore those well if we as leaders don't help people understand what their weaknesses are they'll never know so right. we have to help them be disciplined so that they can move forward um, and overcome some of their weaknesses and shortcomings. So I think that's kind of where we are now. Where I think it's going to go is the ever-increasing um, attention on what people do and how people integrate with an organization. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is that starts with how we recruit people and mm -hmm. hire people. And you've probably heard me talk about the employee life cycle a thousand times. Yes. Um, but all those things and how they're they're tied together, but also how we terminate people. Are we letting the right people go? Are we letting them go at the right time? Are we letting people go that are toxic to the, to the organization? So mm -hmm. I think that all keeps, keeps, up, keeps um, evolving over time. So your other question was about how I keep current with this. Yes. And, and this might, you know, this, all my answers might be long. So I, I apologize. In a head was too. <laughs> um, I keep current by, by going out and experiencing it and talking to people. And um, I'm super excited because next week I'm going on my annual roller coaster trip and oh. I get to visit three of the parks that I've worked with this year. Great. And so now I will get to see, you know, I knew what I did with them preseason and I'll get to see what it looks like now months later in the actual, in, you know, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Oh. So then you get to see you know, was the, was the, the thing that we did, was that as effective as it could have been or could, yeah. we, could we do it even better? Um, so I'm, I'm constantly trying to watch how things happen, figure out, you know, the best way to approach it, knowing that I've, I've made many mistakes in the past, but that's how you learn and that's how you move forward. So um, just trying to keep getting out there and keep talking to people and see what's going on in their world. That's kind of how I try to stay current. Cool. And IAPA, of course. Oh, we have of course. To do an yeah. IAPA plug. That <laughs> always course. gives us good access to uh, people that are doing things different and then getting ideas and thinking about how they might work or not work in your institution. Oh, absolutely. And um, the people that you meet, you know, we met at IAPA, um, all the different characters that you get to run into and talk yeah. to and, and network with and learn yeah. from. I mean, that's, that's what IAP is all about. So that's a great, um, a great opportunity to, to gather a lot of that, that information. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you ready for your next one? Yeah. So this one is not necessarily business related. Um, if you could time travel oh. and, and you could go to any time period, whether it's in the past or even in the future, when, uh, when would you go and why? That's such a good question. Um, going back to the women in leadership question, it is tied. I, I think I'd go to the 1920s just because there was so much evolving with prohibition, with laws, with women, um, taking on more and more leadership roles with women, uh, re reinstating how they are perceived, what they do in the world. That was an exciting time for me um, to read back. I historically connect with that the most and I would love to see what my role would have been then. Um, I, I, I love to lead, I love to, uh, I'm very passionate about things like women in leadership and women's rights and uh, I think I would have been really an advocate for that at that time and I think that it would be also fun to go to a speakeasy <laughs> and also fun just to experience what life was like then. There was so much invention going on and there was so much um, changing and evolving. So I think that would be really fun. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. That's an interesting question too. And that I'm surprised that my answer was go back to the past. I would have thought that I would have gone to the future to learn something to 
change something. Oh, at well, any rate, good question. Well, how far, so speaking of the future, how far yeah. in the future do you think you would go? Wow, people ask me if I, or I ask the question, and I love it as a conversation starter, would I go to Mars? And my answer is always quickly no, uh, because the thought of being something, you know, in something for so long um, that's small scares me. But I, if they had things figured out and you could go to Mars, it, it was like today, now going to Europe, I absolutely would. So how far in the future? I would go pretty far. I would go year 3000 when you can just jump to Mars and see what life is like there. Okay. Maybe we're living underwater because we might not have enough land. I mean, who knows? I would, I think that would be fun. I would go year of 3000. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right. I'm ready for my next one. Okay, good. Uh, mine is not as fun. It's more it's okay. business. So you even touched on it a little bit in your question. How do you get someone on board with why employee recognition and coaching is important? There are still a lot of naysayers out there that don't think it should be part of what our work is. And it takes a lot of work. I mean, it takes a big portion of my day and our leaders' days going through and making sure programs are fair and equitable and mindful and there are people that, that have the belief that that's nonsense, that, that that's just fluff. Yep. And so what do you say to those people? Because I don't always have the time to go through my research. And I, and I certainly point to the literature and the books that are out there. But, but, but how do you, what are some good ways to get them on board with understanding it's not just about fluff and parties? Right. Well, I think probably their, their experience has been with fluff and parties and they haven't seen how impactful it can be. I would say. Um, I would also say that everybody's thinking, what's in it for me? You know, wh why am I going to do this? Why am I going to do a party? Why am I going to do this incentive program? Why am I going to, why do I have to coach my employees? Well, what's in it for you is, you know, less um, stress ultimately because your employees are better trained and they know what they're doing and they can take care of issues without you having to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, better bottom line because they're going to be better salespeople and not just in a sales with money role, but you know, everybody that works at a museum or an amusement park or a water park, they're all in sales. You know, they may not be running the till, but people are making a buying decision based on their interactions with them. So mm -hmm. if they can see that their actions are going to have some sort of positive impact down the road on, on that person and then on the business, you know, that helps to kind of get them in that thought process. And what I found is that a lot of those people are very bottom line driven. You know, yeah. just, just, just give me the facts. Just give me the, I just want to know what's going to make me money. Yeah. Well, that's fine. And, you know, you can, you know, do all the, the dynamic pricing you want to do. And you can, um, you know, figure out all the ways to um, get as much money out of, out of your customers as you can. Um, but I also think that there's a, there's a, important investment that you make in the people that are that are working for you mm -hmm. because ultimately that's going to help you down the road so um, it's a it's a really interesting and tough question because I do run into that um, mm -hmm. and that you know I really start with what's in it asking them kind of putting myself in their shoes what's in it for them why why right. would they want to do this why would they embrace a culture that is so different from what they've grown up in Right. Um, one thing that I did when, when I was um, kind of growing up in the industry is that I had a boss that was kind of like that. And so I started recognizing him. You know, oh, I, was, nice. I was his kind of subordinate, but I would recognize him. Yes, good. You know, and get him to see how it felt. And he's like, oh, this is, this is all right. You know, this, yeah. this makes me want to do stuff. And I'm like, yes, yeah. uh, exactly. Yes. Um, and so... I think that's part of it is maybe that that they are they're behaving in the way that they were taught by their leaders. Right, right. So they probably don't have the the experience of what it really right. feels like to be encouraged and and to be guided, you know, and to and to be coached. What does that really mean? Um, because maybe in the past it's been fluff to them, so they they don't see the value in it. That's a great answer, and I love that you touched on giving some recognition to your boss. That's something we talk a little bit about 
an MSI and it's a difference between some people perceive it, oh, it's just kissing up, and, it, and it's not. It can help pave the way for your boss to know what they've done well to support you. It can be a good two-way relationship. Yeah. So I think that's really important to talk about. It's cool that that was one of the things that you did to show that it, it matters. Absolutely. Well, and it's kind of like you were talking about, it's that whole concept of managing up, right? Yeah. To manage the expectations from your boss and to your boss. And, yeah. you know, I think, I don't have any stats on this, but more people than not are in between two other levels in their organization, right? Everybody's got a boss. And if you're in a leadership role, you have some people that report to you. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be the bridge between those right. two. And what I found is sometimes people are a brick wall. They just won't, um, yes. they won't provide feedback back up to the manager, you know, their managers because they're afraid or they won't, um, they won't give the bad news to their, to their frontline folks because they're afraid of things. And it's just, it's right. a, it's a, it's an awful cycle. Yeah. It really is. So. Yeah. Cool. Did you have a follow up? No, oh, uh, I had a, well, I had a follow up. No, there's oh, yeah. a really great series of tools uh, that the Harvard Business Review does that I re recently received. I was going to see if I had it, but it's all these 20 minute manager reviews. And one of them is managing up, one of it is project management, one of it is delegating. And so these tools are really helpful for new managers. And we've been adapting and using those more. So I just like to put that out there for Absolutely. people working with new, ma new managers is a good tool. Mm -hmm. Well, and that whole new manager thing is so delicate, right? Because people, like you've said before, you know, the women leadership thing is so personal and everybody goes through a different experience. Well, I think new leaders, male or female, they all go through a different experience. Mm -hmm. But if they're, not, if they're not coached, if they're right. not encouraged, if they're not guided and directed and, and corrected, you know, mm -hmm. they're going to get on the wrong path. So yeah. I think, you know, having quick hit tools like that, that, that people can refer to, I think mm -hmm. is fantastic because, you know, as, as a business society, we're always talking about doing more with less. And yep. that seems to be the MO so many different places. Yes. Um, and so what tends to fall by the wayside is training of your new leaders. Yes. You know, here, here's your, you know, in the amusement park industry, here's your keys, here's your radio, go. That's your yeah. training a lot of times. So yeah. um, focusing on some of those critical skills when they're needed, um, mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. So thank you for sharing those. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Is it my, oh, your turn for a question. My <laughs> turn for your last question, if you can believe okay. it. Um, all right. So around um, IAPA, you are known as, you know, the, the queen of improv. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the crazy Chicago girl because well, of the improv. Because that's a, came up on an I have a call. That, <laughs> okay, queen that, of improv. Yeah, that's that's your sub subheading. <laughs> um, but um, so, and you've used it at MSI, and you've inspired other people to use improv activity activities and games, mm -hmm. um, and recruiting and training and building a culture. My question is, where have we not used improv and those kind of activities and those skills? that we could. So what, what are the, the, uh, where's, what's the Mars of, oh, of yeah. improv? You know, where have we not gone with it yet that you see you know, it, an opportunity? It, yeah. At least at the museum of science and industry, one area I'd like to see us get towards is playing improv games with our guests to teach science content. And that's been a dream of mine and a next step of mine because they're, and I can share an example of what that might look like if that sounds a little bit too confusing, no, go ahead, yeah. but so there's a game that you play in improv. I think it's a level, a beginning level game. And you walk around the space and talk about different temperatures and you physicalize the different temperatures. And so when you're cold, you're moving quicker. And when you're hot, you're moving slower. And, it, and research indicates that people are more likely to retain content when they're physicalizing and when they're participating in learning. And so this is one game where we could talk about the different temperatures of the different planets, different atmospheres. There's so much that we could be talking about in using physicality and playing games with our guests in a safe environment or using the fundamental components of an improv game then to build on and to teach some science. And we haven't gotten there yet. We've, we've, we've been real pioneers and we've gotten a ton of support to integrate and, and implement improv and we've seen a ton of wins 
mostly with our teams and our guest facing teams. Improv truly positions people to take what guests know of a given topic and then build on that, much like you take a suggestion from an audience member or your scene partner and build on that. So it's really positioned us to move away from sticking to a script to having two-way conversations. And I think that we, and we know that actually helps with learning and connecting with science um, through some research. But I'd love to see us going to the next level and, and trying to play improv games with guests or having an improv show, a theme park, and having guests part of that improv show. Mm -hmm. uh, having um, guests participate in new ways at the museum at, to learn content I think would be awesome. Um, and I want to think about that more, but but we are going to try improvising with guests at our members open house coming up, just to help talk about this is some of the techniques that we use at MSI to be most guest focused and to connect with guests and to teach science content. So I'm excited to see how that goes. It's it's July 20th, I think, so I'm really excited about that. That's very cool. Very cool. Taking it to the to the guests as well, and I, I yeah. love, love what you say about you know teaching and and getting them you know to, to move around and things like that. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and I'm, maybe Universal or Disney they're already doing this kind of thing, but they do pop up shows all the time. Getting guests part of that. Mo most guests are watching, but getting them into the show, um, it it is. I think it's a cool concept. Giving them a role in the show. We do a little bit of that with Poop Happens and some of our live science experiences but it would be cool to see that go even to the next level, working with our guests. So just to clarify, Poop Happens is not a live experience, <laughs> is it? It's a live science experience that happens daily at MSI. Okay. It's a show. I know, I kind of threw that in there, jargon. Yeah. It's a show <laughs> that uh, takes you through the digestive process. It's really hands-on. And that's okay. all I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> so to, that we get people to come. Right, exactly. Go to MSI for that. Our and, volunteers wear buttons that say, ask me where poop happens. Oh, so, nice, nice. At MSI. Fun and, you know, to that point, we have guests participate, and we've gotten so much great feedback about that. Kids then go home and are inspired to do their science fair projects on the digestive system because that whole program is based on participation and participatory and asking questions and answering and getting up on stage and being in the show and having a specific role and uh, I think that makes it personal in a way in which is really really resonates with guests and I see the field moving across the board people want highly personalized experiences and so how can we as an industry design personalized experiences for large groups I think these are some really exciting challenging questions and we've just um, hit the tip of the iceberg about what we can do, and I think improv is a is a fabulous tool to help get us there. Oh, agree, absolutely agree. And it was interesting you mentioned you know Disney and Universal; they've been doing kind of audience participation for a long time. You know, yeah. all theater has, but um, you know, you bring up an, an interesting you know twist to it, which is the education part, because yeah. I think that's always been about entertainment, and yeah. you know. You get, get some laughs and you're, you're entertained and your family has fun and that's great and you walk away and you go to your next attraction. Um, right. But where it sounds like you're trying to take it, which is really exciting, is also the education part of it. Um, yeah. Where you're learning some new skill or you're learning about the body yes. or you're learning about the yes. atmosphere or whatever, which is, you know, that yes. that takes the, the personalized, you know, engaged experience to the next level, which is really cool. Thank you. you. Just cool. give me three more ideas of improv games and programs where we could teach science content. I get them awesome. all the time. We just haven't gone there yet. Okay. Good. Good. I'd love to hear how that goes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I think we're down to your last question for me. I am, yeah. So yeah. I thought you were going to wrap up. I'm getting. Oh, no. No. I'm all warmed up now. You got we can one. start now. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm just> nervous. <laughs> Finally. Um, okay. Right. The the third question, and this is funny because I just came from my department meeting and. I asked a couple of people and they said, oh, I'm so glad you're asking Matt Heller that question because we all, that was going to be my question to Matt Heller and it's, um, okay, all of us at MSI want to be you. What is your secret to always being so positive, never seeming stressed and always in great spirits and upbeat? Like I've never once in all the years seen you, do you get stressed? Oh, sure. <laughs> what is yeah. your secret to being so positive and genuine and sincere with every single interaction you have. Well, first of all, thank you. Genuinely thank you uh, for that. <laughs> um, 
I think, well, first of all, yes, I'm a human being. So of course I get stressed. Of course I have bad days. Of course there's times when I want to punch a wall. But um, <laughs> I think part of it around, first of all, clients and, you know, you know, IAPA, the, the IAPA um, community um, is that I just love that environment. And it just, it kind of puts me in a happy place, if you will. Um, yeah. I've always loved the theme park and amusement park business and, and certainly zoos and aquariums and museums are, are an extension yeah. of that. So um, I'm also very much of a people person. So yeah. people give me energy. Um, so when I'm around them, I tend to, to feed off the positive energy and try to um, try to, to, to give back some of the positive energy as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's just, I, I think I've just found where I need to be. Like you, we talked about engagement earlier, yeah. right? Um, I think I just, I'm just naturally engaged with this audience. I'm naturally engaged with the kind of things that I get to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm naturally engaged with the, the kind of people that I get to interact with. Yeah. Um, I've done some, since I started my own, my own training business, I did some work with, with a finance group and I've done some things oh. in healthcare and they were fine, but it's not like going to a museum where we're, we're talking about the visitor experience and we're talking about guests and we're talking yeah. about all the crazy things that guests do and, you know, yeah. things like that. Or we're, we're going to an amusement park and we're talking about, you know, guests on a roller coaster and all that, all that kind of fun stuff. To me, that's, that's what gets me excited. So it's not difficult to get excited about those kind of things in front of other people. Um, there's also, so that's sort of the... So if we saw oh, you on a bank, we'd see a different Matt Heller. Totally, <laughs> totally. Especially if they screwed up my deposit. Um, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> but, um, so that's sort of the subconscious part. But there's also a, a very conscious part of wanting to portray a very positive outlook. And I, this may come from kind of the performer in me because I'm a drummer. I've been, you know, on stage yes. a lot and things. And I've always thought of what I do as a performance. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, talking to 30 people, you know, in, in a classroom or it's talking to 500 people or it's talking to one person on a computer, there is, <laughs> there is a performance element that I'm always thinking, yep. first of all, the show must go on. You, yes. you've, you've got to just do it. Um, and then it's always about the audience. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to think about what's the best thing to do for this particular audience, whether it's a conference or a client. You know, it's not about me. I'm the, the conduit that's bringing some information and facilitating a discussion. But ultimately, it's about what they walk away with. It's, it's ultimately about how they perceive their, the time that they spent because time is ever more valuable to people. So yeah. I've got to make sure that the investment that they've made in coming to see me is worth it. Um, so I think just putting it in that perspective, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that I just, that's, that's sort of the, the external perspective or that's the, that's the conscious, I'm making conscious decisions to do things in a certain way, um, kind of because of that performer mentality. That's great to know. Thank you. You're now welcome. I feel like I know, I have a little more insight to okay. How you do it. Okay. Do you need to take that? We'll wait. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Um, so that was my three questions. Were there any follow-ups or anything from, from you? You asked a question once, which really, I think it was at an IAPA conference, and I think okay. it was at a panel, and I thought it was funny. Okay. So I'm going to ask it to you. Okay. What is more important, the pizza or the box? <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that the question the is close the question was um what's the most important part of the pizza okay and it was last year's ceo speaks session um, yes. and so we had the three executives up on stage and um mm -hmm. one of the gentlemen said well the box because that's what um keeps it warm you know, when it's being delivered. So if you don't have the box, then it's just going to fly all over the place and it's not going to get to you the way it needs to get to you. So he, he said that the box was the most important. Um, if I were to answer that question, yes, the box is important. But to me, pizza is about the cheese. <laughs> okay. The cheese, the cheese, the cheese. Um, <laughs> and the ratio between the cheese and the sauce. Got to have a good cheese to sauce ratio. What's What's the good ratio? 
like eight parts cheese and half part sauce. Okay. No, <laughs> okay. Um, so you'd like deep dish yes, Chicago deep absolutely. dish. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, love um, lots of cheese on the pizza, and um, and enough sauce to to you know have the flavor there. But yeah. if it's too saucy with not enough cheese, mm. now okay. I will tell you this. <laughs> That goes completely opposite of what you just said. Um, I was in Italy. Yes, just recently. Yeah, a couple months ago. And we did a food tour in Trastevere, which is right outside of Rome. And they had cheeseless pizza. Oh. So it was the crust and sauce and spices and things. And it was amazing. Wow. <laughs> so maybe, maybe Americanized pizza, I'm more about the cheese. But that was, that was pretty incredible. So... Did you like it better than the other kinds of pizza over there? I think my, because I had that, and then we we also took a pizza making cooking class oh, yeah. in Naples. That was probably my favorite, um, because you know just being in there and putting it in the oven myself and choosing how much cheese and sauce and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff goes on it. Um, I probably enjoyed that one more, mm -hmm. uh, but I was I was pleasantly surprised how much I liked that pizza without the without the yeah. without the cheese on it so mm. what would you say how would you answer that oh the pizza hands down <clears throat> i would eat it cold <laughs> um the box is important it's yeah. better to have a hot pizza yeah but um the most important part of the pizza the toppings okay yeah what are your favorite it's toppings spinach pepperoni mushrooms um onions uh, pepper, just tons of stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. And it depends on what mood I'm in about what pizza. Sure. So if it's a pepperoni day or a spinach day, but that's what I get really excited about. Okay, I cool. think about pizza. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right, so I think that brings us to the end. Unfortunately, this was a lot of fun. It was fun. Thank you, fun. Heather, for joining me. Yes, um, thank you for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. So also want to give a shout out to Rebecca. Um, who helped us connect everything. So thank you, Rebecca. I was hoping she would stick around, but... <laughs> We've got some other footage. Maybe we can edit her in later. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you again for joining me, and um, thank you, everybody who is out there who might be listening, and um, I hope you have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Yay! Thank you!